Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is a companion video. What are companion videos? Well, I'm awfully glad that you asked. See, every day on the John Campia Show, Monday through Friday, we take the second half of the show to take your live comments and questions. However, we normally don't have enough time to get through all the live comments and questions that get sent in, but I want to make sure you guys don't have to wait too long to get those questions answered. So what we do is we gather them up and we address them here on companion videos. And I am once again joined for this great companion video by the great Kimberly Curran. Kimberly, how you doing? I'm awesome. I'm doing great. Doing great. I love your shirt. What's the what's the story behind the shirt there? Wonder Woman. It's a nice shirt. I've never <laughs> seen a Wonder Woman shirt in green. I really like I know. that. Oh, I love this. I love this. I love searching high and low for awesome t-shirts and I always wear things that mean something to me and um I just love this. I just I love it love too. It. It's super cool, man. All right. Well, we do have a bunch of your questions to get to, so let's not waste any time and get right to it. Kimberly, what is up first? All right, this is coming from Movie Idiot. For Bucky's sake, I hope Rocket does not find out the secret combination to his arm. Oh, I'm going to get that arm. <laughs> I love Rocket <laughs> Raccoon. If for no other reason, that's enough reason to look forward to uh, to Guardians of the Galaxy 3. I'm totally looking forward to that. I'm going to get that arm. All right, what's next? Double B Studios says, John, you keep calling yourself a nobody. You're not a nobody. You're a wiener. Shark Tale. Wiener. I joke, but for reals, thank you from the bottom of my heart and wife's heart. Campia University, your classrooms teach us more about movies than movies themselves. Oh, uh, thanks so much, man. And listen, yeah, listen, when I refer to myself as a nobody, I mean, we are all important. We all have value. And so do I. I am important and have value. But I'm just saying, like, some people misinterpret because, you know, I, I do a little YouTube show, whatever, like I'm some kind of celebrity. I'm not. I'm a nobody. Like when you compare even to people I know who have much much, 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 much bigger YouTube presences than I do. Uh, I just love what I do, and I'm glad I get to do it with the community, like you guys being involved here. So that's really special. So thanks for the kind words, man. I appreciate that. Okay, what's next? And John, doggone it, people like you. I'm, I'm good enough. I'm smart <laughs> enough. Uh, Steve Pinter says, hey, John, whatever happened to your cartoon image of you wearing a green arrow suit? Oh, I love that picture. I remember I used to love seeing it when you first started your YouTube channel. Also, since you told us about your video with Anne, I see why you love the filthy. OK, so oh, I'm, wow. I'm, I'm not going to go revisit that. I'm not going to revisit that story. You guys remember that story. Uh, but hold on a second. I'm just digging through here. I want to. I haven't actually brought it up in a while. Let me see. I Let's remember see. that. That was a cool graphic. It is. And you know what? Yeah, okay. Got it. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I got it. All right. Yeah. So here is that. Here's the, the picture in question. Uh, let me see if I can get it to the right size here. There we go. Um, I, I love this because now at the time, I really loved uh, the Arrow show on CW. And uh, one of our viewers, I can't remember who, but one of our viewers, obviously a really good artist, made this picture for me. And I loved it so much that when we first launched the John Campia show, at, when we first launched, we just called the John Campia podcast, even though we had a video version of it on YouTube. Um, and I just used it for our main image and we used it as our main image for a long time. I love it. By the way, if any of you know who made this image, if, first of all, if you are the person who made this image, or if you remember who made this image, please do email me at john at the john and let me know who, because I would just like to give them a shout out uh, for that because I used it for a long time and I love it, love it, love it so much. So thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that very, very much. Okay, what's next? Dave the Rave says, good morning, John and Rob. Not sure if I missed you discussing this, but I watched Chaos Walking this weekend. Holy moly, what a crap show. Two hours of my life lost. Ugh. Don't think the reshoots worked. Did you guys see it? Thoughts? You know what? I, I, I must admit, I still haven't watched it. I mean, we spent a couple of years hearing about what an utter disaster that movie was. And then they knew it was unwatchable. So they had to do a ton of reshoots. But Tom Holland and Daisy Ridley were very, very busy. But Daisy Ridley in particular was embarking on doing like the whole worldwide four month long promotional tour of the most recent Star Wars movie. It finally took them like a year to get back up running again. Then they reshot it all. 
and I still haven't seen it. I'm not going to lie. I, I I do what because looks. I like Daisy Ridley. I love Tom Holland. I like the director. I do want to see it. I just you know I keep hearing it's not so good. Did you ever get around to watching this movie? At I all? did not. No, I did me not. And um, I was so disappointed to hear. I did. I did watch some reviews and um. Yeah, it was really, really sad. But um, I, I still want to give it a try, honestly. I do too. I want to give it a try because you know it's subjective, and but the but the, ma- the majority seems for. to. Yeah. It's hard to get excited for when all you're hearing about the is the buzz bad adds things. to your excitement. The buzz is like, okay, okay. Or and the opposite. The opposite is like, yep. you should just take a nap. Yeah. All right. What's next? Suthia says, did a double feature of Boss Level and Outside the Wire. Are they both Netflix? No. LOL. Boss Level is Hulu. It's about Frank Gorillo stuck in a time loop and needs to find out why. Starting over and over while trying to get Big Boss Mel Gibson. I enjoyed it. Uh, Edge of Tomorrow vibe with humor. Gorilla is great with action. Outside the Wire was a little less enjoyable. Story confused me a little, though. However, Anthony Mackie is phenomenal in action movies. MCU, Altered Carbon, and now this. Listen, I'll tell you what. Boss Level is a fun little movie. I did watch that one with Frank Grillo. It's kind of funny because... You know, I was watching for a bit that um, that show he had, that MMA show he had called Kingdom, which was uh, which was all right, which was pretty good. But I really like Frank Grillo as an action movie. It works. It's fun. Sit back, turn off your brain, have some fun with it. And it, it delivers on that level. It really does. Now, at the same time, it's it's a big missed opportunity because it could have been like a special sci-fi action kind of thing. Like this whole thing about like what's causing the time loop. They don't go into it at all. They name it and say, Oh, it's this thing. Okay. What brought it about? How does it work? Why is it dangerous? What's the ramification? They never touch on any of that. It's just, co- it's just uh, common. this is the thing that causes the thing, you know, the o- thing. Okay. The, you know, the thing, the thing. So it was kind of dumb, but you know what? That was okay. Because it's so enjoyable, like the action in it's so enjoyable. And Frank Grillo, I like Frank. I haven't seen Frank Grillo, Grillo in something yet that I have not enjoyed him in. I really like him, and I like yeah. his attitude. I've seen him in a few interviews, and I really like his attitude and his outlook on things. And that makes me even enjoy his films all the more. You know what's and, crazy? Huh? I was just watching a video of his on YouTube. Uh huh. It's like it was, he called it "Staying in Shape at 55," and he's not 55. Oh, he's 55. Yeah, yeah. What? And his video is called Staying Zaddy. in Shape at 55. What? And I'm like, oh my gosh. For part of my language, fuck that dude. I'm looking at that dude <laughs> and his physique and what he's still able he's what he's able 55. to do. He's 55. Wow. And it is, and you know what? He ain't about to slow down. Like that guy's in such phenomenal shape and he 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 has such a certain particular screen presence mm-hmm. that there will be top line roles for him in movies. For a long time to come. He's going to be doing this kind of stuff well into his 60s with the type of shape he keeps himself in. And I, have, for one, am glad to see it. I am. I like it. I like, I it, like it. All right. What's next? Vision with the Mind Stone says, after reading Ray Fisher's article, it just further shows how ridiculous and utterly chaotic WB was when DC, when Justice League came out. What are your thoughts on the article? And do you think the situation with Justice League will always plague WB when it comes to DC? No, I don't. I think most people don't care. I, I think there is a there is a segment of people who care about the whole Justice League drama, and and they always will. But I think the majority of people out there, and moviegoers and fans, don't care. And I I think that's going to disappear from their memory pretty fast. Look, as far as the Ray Fisher situation goes, I have no intention of ever talking about Ray Fisher again until he does something else. Yeah, you know, yeah. of note. Um. But because you asked, I will answer the question, but only because you asked. Here's the thing. I have I have not liked the way I, I've been very public. I don't I haven't liked the way Ray Fisher's handled the whole Warner Brothers situation mm. from the beginning, mm. because from the beginning, his approach has been. And, and by the way, while the whole time emphasizing I wasn't there for all I know, no, I mean, this sounds ridiculous. I know. But honestly, for all I know. The producers and executives at Warner Brothers, every day that Ray Fisher came into work, they filled 
you know, uh, pillowcases filled with bars of soap and beat him for 15 minutes as he came in, kind of like a military raz razzing or something. For all I know, that's, but I don't know. I wasn't there. For all I know, he was the most horribly mistreated person in the history of Hollywood. For all I know, it's all complete BS. But so I, I wasn't there. I have no idea. I just know that if you want to come out and start attacking people publicly, then tell us why you're attacking them. And for the longest time, Ray Fisher's thing has been, those people are jerks, those people are jerks, and that guy's a jerk, and that guy's a jerk. And we have been sitting here, really? Wow. Okay, uh, uh, why are they a jerk? Well, I'm not going to tell you why they're a jerk. You just need to know that they're jerks. Uh, okay. And I just haven't liked that approach. And when you don't give specifics, I mean, he claimed for a while that I'm not allowed to give specifics because I'm under an NDA. Mm -hmm. But then they interviewed the head of Warner Media and said, no, he is not under any NDA. He can say whatever he wants. Um. That, I mean, whatever, that seems really weird. So then he finally does this interview with The Hollywood Reporter. And you know what? Instead of just talking about it, hold on a second. Let me, sorry, because I, I want to, this is important. So I want to make sure. It's kind of one of those one things you just want to like quote, address it and, yeah, you know, head on. I this at least properly info. here. Hold on a second. It's a bummer. That's not it that's it okay so he finally did this interview with the hollywood reporter and he made a lot of allegations about racism and, and the happening on set and stuff like that and so what warner brothers did was they went out as is their responsibility to get an outside counsel to come in and do an independent investigation into anything and they didn't just get anyone they went out and got a federal judge who's a practicing lawyer as well who's been who's got a lot of experience in these independent investigations and mediations her name's Catherine Forrest is the name of the judge they brought in to do this so this is in the Hollywood Reporter article let me see if I can just bring this on screen because it's like I said it's kind of key here this is what um, the Hollywood Reporter thing says uh, about this and I'm gonna, again I'm gonna see if I can get this in here properly I'm not sure if I can here we go okay it says the following I can't bring it up properly sorry guys I don't have it lined up right so uh, I'll, I'll just read it here um, it says Catherine Forrest a former federal judge who conducted the Warner Media probe tells the Hollywood Reporter in a statement that in interviews with more than 80 witnesses she found no credible support for claims of racial animus or racial insensitivity a Warner Media spokesperson notes that the company made extraordinary efforts to accommodate Mr. Fisher's concerns about the investigation and to ensure its fullness and fairness and has complete confidence in the investigation process and Judge Forrest's conclusions. So that's what the independent investigator said. Now, as I started to read through Ray Fisher's things, what I suspected what we would find is exactly what was there. It wasn't anything that happened it was Ray Fisher's interpretations of things that happened. For example, in this, I don't know if you had a chance to read this article. I but did not read it, no. In the article, one of the big points for Ray Fisher was the fact that in the theatrical version of the movie, a significant, all of Cyborg's mother's role was taken out. And much of, obviously his dad was in the theatrical version, but a lot of his dad's stuff is also taken out. So he interpreted that and presented it as they didn't want to have two highly intelligent black people and a highly intelligent black couple in the mm. movie. Nobody said that. That was his, you know, proclamation of the event. Yeah. When in reality, Joss Whedon was given a mandate to cut two hours out of the movie. And now that we've seen it, we're like, whoa, that yeah. was, you cut, you cut a lot. But did you know who else he took out? Willem there was De a Willem Defoe. lot cut. They took out Willem Dafoe's mm -hmm. character, Volko, yeah. who's very important. It's basically like if you are asked to take out two hours and you have six main characters, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Cyborg, Flash, and Aquaman, not to mention, you know, you've got your main villain in Steppenwolf and you want to pepper in there some dark side because that's what all the fans are saying. So you have arguably nine or uh, eight main characters and you have to cut two hours out of the movie that means any secondary characters are the first ones to go they have to go they're not the main characters now that meant that yeah uh half of cyborg's dad's role went all of cyborg's mom willem dafoe's volko um um iris west iris, which yeah. that scene should have been cut out of the movie anyway yeah that really points to the film but it meant all secondary characters had to go. Mm -hmm. And so 
what I found was reading through the whole, and I, and I encourage everybody to read the article for yourselves, to see it for yourselves. Don't just take my interpretation of it. You go read the Hollywood Reporter article um, on this whole thing. Almost everything was, this happened, and Ray Fisher saying, what that really meant was this. And I'm like, so when I go back and read what Judge Forrest had to say, that she found no credible support of claims of racial animus. Now, that doesn't mean there weren't people acting unprofessionally. That doesn't mean a lot of the other things, but it just, it ended up being what I thought was much ado about nothing. And it's unfortunate. Now, none of that is to take away. I'm a huge Joss Whedon fan. I've been a Joss Whedon fan for many, most of my adult life. I've been a Joss Whedon fan. Um, he has, you know, been on panels of mine. He's come to parties I've done. He has always been very generous in granting interviews all that kind of stuff. I've been a big, big fan. I love Firefly. I love, I mean, his Avengers movie is my favorite comic book movie of all time, all that kind of stuff. But outside of this Justice League situation, I don't know if you're aware of what's been going on with the, like the Buffy the Vampire situation. I, I did read that. Yeah, like, I was aware of that. That as was disturbing. As a fan of Joss Whedon, it has been very difficult and um, disappointing. Yeah, the one young lady being pregnant and yeah, and, and Sarah Michelle and Geller, did, uh, yeah, Sarah Michelle Geller, who never says anything about anything. Mm -hmm. She came out and made statements. It's like so. Okay, look, clearly Joss Whedon maybe acts like an ass and acts like a jerk. I mean, it's I, just very disappointing as a big Joss Whedon fan to hear that stuff. So I don't want to undermine. That just because the stuff we're reading in here doesn't mean that maybe he didn't act like an ass. That sometimes. people's experience, yeah, yeah. It's different than what than what we see. Because I mean, what did someone say one time? There's there's her side, his side, and the truth. And when stories like this come out, we're not privy to. We don't know whose side of what we're getting. I mean, obviously, when many people are saying the same thing, you do have to kind of tick your. Yeah. Brain and go, okay, to I'm going to have to pay attention to this and step back a little. But like you said, we weren't there. But but if the majority, I mean, it, it's almost like survey says Warner Brothers is not <laughs> survey says. really a non-toxic work environment. The buzz is that it's pretty toxic. You can be in a toxic energy without an investigator being able to say well this happened and this happened and this i mean i've been in situations where I, like that where i'm like it's not a specific action or situation but you know how certain people are answering you you know how the tone you know you you can't an investigator is not going to go oh so their tone was talking you know gaslighting you or talking to you like you were an idiot well i can't put that on my list did they push you did they grab your bottom did they you know what i'm saying like yeah so that's not to take away from his experience and say maybe it was a very toxic environment. Maybe you did notice the snickers and the hmm and the ugh and the eye rolls. Stuff like that can be toxic and to ma and make you feel isolated. So I think that's why it's important to take all of this with a grain of salt, but at the same time not take anything away from someone's experience. And that's why it's tough when situations hap happen like this with films because I've always said like celebrities or actors you have a job just like anybody else. The only difference is that your job gets way more attention. Yeah. The nurse in the hospital, the attorney, the person that does your insurance, they're affecting our lives just as much as we watch a film and it makes us cry and it makes us feel. All of us are important. All of our jobs are important, but not, you know, 45 million people didn't watch the nurse work today but we are watching that person on screen. So the good parts of the industry get magnified, but the negative parts do too. And that's the hard, the hard thing about navigating these situations. And it's tough. And I think it's, it's good. It gets called out. It's good to, you know, speak your truth to the powers that be, be it HR, be it an attorney, um, be it the hires up. But when the whole world is watching, it's really hard to convey the exact energy of toxicity that was in the workplace. It's it's a it's a tough thing. Yeah, it's I mean, and, and so it's again all I'm as somebody who just simply was not there. I just go by okay. They got a federal court judge who's now a practicing attorney in law and does independent investigations, and they say they found certain things. That doesn't mean everything was rosy and great, but at the same time, it kind of looks like it was what I suspected it was. So I mean, I, I don't know, and that's why I don't bring up. 
Ray Fisher on the show or this situation. Yeah. Look, I think Ray Fisher did a very good. I thought Ray Fisher was a really good cyborg in the theatrical. Oh, cut, man, he was. Let alone in the Snyder I, cut. I got a totally different experience from him in, in the Snyder cut. And the Snyder cut, I was like, yes, I see your range. I see your depth. You're not just another member of the kick ass team. You're, I see your character portrayal. Yep. I, I respected the performance. Not that I didn't respect his performance in the, the Weeding cut. I thought cut, it was even good call in the theatrical it. version, but, but, but even better but, in the. Yeah, but I'm just saying I got to see more of him in the Snyder cut, and I was so yeah. happy to see that. Um, so it's, it's a tough thing. It's like, we got to have empathy, but also, unless it's like super obvious, like a Weinstein situation where it's like, no, your ass is canceled, you know, well, see, no, but, if it's not that, then you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt and step back and go, you know what? I wasn't there, but, but you know what? That is your truth. And I'm going to respect and have empathy for your truth. Again, I just, I, w I still remain uncomfortable with how he chose to navigate and manage it because yeah. unlike say something, you, you just brought up the Weinstein situation. Yeah. That's a dude who did things yeah. that we, it's almost unspeakable. Yeah. And there are people that went to lawyers and didn't go to the press, I, but they, they reported it. They went to lawyers, they went to therapists and friends. And then some people got on Twitter. Yeah, I just, so I don't know, maybe it's because you know, I, grew up, I grew up working road construction. I worked in mm -hmm. law offices, whatever. I just get, I don't know, rich, famous actors getting upset. Somebody was mean to me. Mm -hmm. Guess what? When I worked on a road construction crew, I had my Portuguese foreman <laughs> like yelling every profanity at the book at me when I was not getting that ditch graded properly or quickly enough or whatever because yeah. I was holding things back. When my first law office job, my lord, who I love, I loved that he's passed away recently, my first boss in my law office, but I loved him. But he was blah, blah, like constant, constant, you know, lawyer the grouch. Like blah, blah, blah. But I knew where he was coming from and he, he wanted the job done. He wanted the job done right and he wanted the job done his way. He was the boss. I appreciated that. But at the end of the day, when the young, young scuffing, you know, I didn't go home and cry. Man, he's mean. I, I went home and said, I got to do my job better. And I, I ended up having a great relationship, but I don't know. Again, I'm not trying. But to that's look. life. There's those situations yeah. where I mean, I remember being young in the in the in the workplace and calling my dad, who uh, was in the corporate world for years, and going, "Daddy." And there were some conversations where my dad would say, "Toughen up, Kimberly. I love you. You're my daughter, but this is the real world, honey." Yeah. And there were certain situations where I made a call to my dad, and he goes, "Okay, who's your HR person tomorrow morning?" You need to talk to them and don't sit at your desk until you talk to them. Yeah, because there, there is are a different line situations that call for different things. And sometimes yes. you got to suck it up and sometimes you need to report it. Yeah. And I think the problem is maybe our society has been too far one way for a while where it's yeah. like you're told to suck it up. And yes, I think there are many times that we have in our lives. So we just need to suck it up. But then we think when there are certain things that happen that do cross a line where it's like, no, 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 no. You don't just suck it up. At, and sometimes you need, you need another to voice about it. you need and that's why it's important to talk to someone it's important yeah. to talk to someone and reach out because some people will say you know sorry but this is how law is honey it's like this and some people will say okay i have a friend who's a lawyer and i want you to give him a call you yeah. know there's that's why it's important to reach out because this is life when yeah. we need each other to navigate it we need each other you know all right Let's move on from this. What is next? Hashtag justice for Hopkins says <laughs> hashtag Carly has it coming. Hey, listen, I'm sure at some point in the history of that MCU universe, Carly was probably a really good person who saw great injustice being done and thought she needs to do something about it. But at some point you lose your way when she tied up civilians and blew up a building with them in it. When she threatened Sam Wilson's sister and the lives of her children. She crossed the line and with he the was death, like, oh, oh, it's like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you don't and, want Falcon coming to you like and that. With the death Carly. Of Battlestar. She probably does have it coming at this point. All right. What's next? The sock says if I were Sam there, there would have been no more talking after Carly called Sarah. I would have gone straight Terminator and <laughs> burned the body. So there's how did Thanos put it? No more resurrections. Yeah. I mean, look, and, I, and you could tell, too, in the show. <laughs> When he found out from his sister that Carly called her, his temperament and his approach to the situation changed. Like he was still, look, we're going to try to minimize damage here. I'm still going to try to talk her down. But there was no more margin. You know, it was, it, there was no more. He wasn't just playing good cop with her when he no. went in to talk with her. Yeah. He was feeling her 
issues. He was really feeling her First and time. really, yeah, and really <laughs> trying to be a mentor to her and and level with her. But you you, you did oh oh you you threatened my my nephews. Yeah. Okay, we're not talking anymore. There's no yeah. more conversation. Yeah. All right. What's next? Mm-mm. The Sock says, this is one of three. I think the government will side with Walker. However, I think he's going to do just a step too far. He's going to go, excuse me, just a step too far. I think he begins to disregard the safety of civilians and get a few killed. I believe they will then bench him at the very last. And his least. girl, at the very least, you know what? I don't know why I didn't grab him. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> They're sitting right here, and I'm like, I don't know why I didn't grab my glasses. Um, at, da, 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 at the very least, and his girlfriend will hear about this incident. After killing the flag smasher and this, she will leave him and cause him to spiral further. The government will charge Sam and Bucky to apprehend him, making him feel betrayed by his country. Assuming Sharon is the power broker, she will hear about this and enlist him as her muscle. I know it's a stretch if there ever was, but I'm curious to see accurately my prediction plays out. All right. So my one thought about it is, look, I right now believe and, you know, I'm not willing to put money on this because I don't firmly believe it. But I right now believe that the government is going to back what John did. I think he, they're going to back him saying he took down a terrorist, uh, bomb civilians. I'm not sure about that, but that's what I think they're going to do. But everything else that you're laying out, Sock, you got to remember, there are literally there's an hour and 20 minutes left in the show. Can you believe if that, that? If that. Can you even believe that? There's an hour and 20 minutes left. There's two episodes left. That, and that's it. So what the, the chart you've laid out may come into play if we were talking after episode two, but with only two episodes left and with the fact that we just saw a preview for the next episode where it's got the three of them and, you know, Walker saying, you don't want to do this. And Bucky saying, yeah, we really do. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's going to go down. They're going to take this. But I, I do believe that they ultimately the government is ultimately going to back his play on that. And that's going to embolden him even more. And then we'll see what happens after Sam and Bucky take the shield from him. All right. What's next? Max with two X's. First time tipping. Love the show. Thanks, Max. I know this will never happen, but what if the power broker, broker turns out to be Raymond Reddington? No. The blacklist. <laughs> no. Either way, I'm curious why there are no bounty hunters going after Sam and Bucky outside of Madripoor. Well, Avi, hey, listen, if, if uh, the blacklist was on ABC, which is owned by Disney, I would say no. Absolutely not. That's not going to happen. But there is a 1% chance out of anything because it's Disney. Owned. The Blacklist is an NBC show owned by Universal. So that so no, I I, will, I never like to pull out the, the egg. I never like to pull out the egg, but I will give it a zero. That's a zero <laughs> chance. Of Talk that. about a crossover. As far as why aren't they going after him outside? I don't know. Maybe very limited thing. It may be look because if maybe they say the power broker doesn't want extra country heat he doesn't want to take heat for like if if they kill somebody under his orders in some other country that other country's like you're committing murders in our country now you've got our attention so that might be the type of heat that the power broker whether it's sharon or not might want to avoid all right what's next jojo giraffe says over under 25 percent chris nolan directs a james bond film after no time to die i know it's very unlikely i'm just so curious to see what he would bring to the franchise especially with how big of a fan he is of the the series and the spy genre. All right. Here's hoping. I will say over 25%. I think so too. I would say over 50 when you consider he's one of the best directors in the world. He's made it very public how much of a James Bond fan he is and over kind of all that kind of stuff. But I'm not going to go over 50. And the reason for that is this. Christopher Nolan is at a place in his career where he is not going to take notes from anybody. And the Broccoli's who own James Bond, they are not going to go, oh yeah, some director, whichever director it is, you just do whatever you want with our property. They're gonna wanna have creative input and ultimate you know, control because it's their character. I don't think that's an environment Chris Nolan's gonna work in. There was a time in his career where he would have, working with Warner Brothers on Batman. So sure, when he was like, you know, he's coming out of, you know, uh, Memento and things like that. And so, yeah, he gets this Batman movie. He's young in his career. He's probably okay with taking notes from a studio, blah. The 
the type of control Christopher Nolan wants and has earned over his movies versus the kind of control that an IP as huge and generational and as important and as valuable as James Bond, that's just, so I'll still say over 25%. But I can't say over one of those creative differences situations. It's it's you know what? It's going to be them wanting to avoid creative differences yeah. because in this, if there's a creative difference, Christopher Nolan loses because he doesn't own the property. Christopher Nolan does not want to put himself in a position where somebody else gets to tell him no. And that's just where he's at as a director. Steven Spielberg, Christopher Nolan, Martin Scorsese, um, Quentin Tarantino. These are directors who are at that point where they can have flex that kind of muscle so i i don't see it happening because he's going to say i would love to do it if you give me full creative control and the broccolis are going to say we would love to have you on our movie but you know we're not going to give you full creative control which is what 95 percent of other directors have to deal with so uh, still still a decent chance so he loves this property so over 25 but under 50 that's where i'm at all right, what's next? Ryan Lawner says, I just watched Hell or High Water. Awesome. And, and there's a lot of great stuff in it, but also one big problem that kept me from really liking it, I've reached a point where I have absolutely zero patience for characters like Jeff Bridges' Ranger, where we're supposed to see them as some kind of lovable rascal and they're actually just a nasty racist. You can't exactly argue no one knew it was wrong. It was only 2016 and it's made me hesitant to check out Mackenzie's other work. Okay, I see what you're saying, Ryan, but here's here's the issue I have with what you're saying. Because directly or indirectly, kind of what you're saying is any characters written in movie need to be written as idealistic characters. One of the strengths of movies like Hell or High Water or a number of Quentin Tarantino movies or whatever is they're not writing ideal characters they're writing characters that will come with their own sets of idiosyncrasies their own sets of uh uh character and their own flaws straight up flaws and that to me is why a movie like hell or high water works it's because they're not paint jeff bridges's character isn't painted as this he is the ultimate. He's not Captain America. Cop. He's Yeah, he's not Captain America. No. He's a dude who's a sheriff. This is the way he's lived his life. And that comes with these strengths and it comes with these obvious weaknesses. And I, I appreciate that about movies like this. Give us multiple dimension, Complexity. multiple layered characters. The real complexities of real people. So I agree with your critique of the character as the man. But to me, having these flaws in them makes it more watchable for somebody like, but I don't know. How do you take on that? Because, I mean, it's it's a it's a difficult thing. You We're know, not saying he's ideal, but yeah, I, I love know. that film. But films are an examination of the human condition and people are complicated. And there are people, especially with the, the, these past few years, I've, I've seen people say about their family members, I never knew my uncle was racist. <laughs> he was so nice and he's so philanthropic. And But the thing about film is that it goes into human beings and are the black, the white and the gray. And some films lend themselves to focusing on the white or the black, like Inglorious Bastards. Like this guy is a bad guy and a racist and he should be taken down and shot in the forehead. And then there's situations like this character where it's like oh i feel for him oh he's a good man of the law what, what what did you just say that is so racist dude like but that's what i love about film i don't want to see perfect characters because out here in the world what we're experiencing film is taking us to another level of whether it's what if or this is what happened or this is what they're thinking when they say that and i love that about films i don't have a problem with his character I, I can look at the character and go, oh, that's messed up. But I don't I would never say take him out or redo that or you should have made him honorable. This ladies and gentlemen, this is people. I remember I, I shouldn't even be telling this story, but I'm going to tell it. Anyway. <laughs> so I remember you're talking about I mean, listen, we all have stories we can tell about our parents or grandparents and ideologies or opinions or attitudes they have about certain things. Right. I still remember. The first black girl I ever dated, 
and I went out and that was totally new experience for me. Right. I, I like I, I went to this Italian Catholic high school. I only ever dated, you know, people like that. It's like what that a- story with Robin De Niro wrote um, where he was his son. He played the bus driver. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, what's that called? Once Upon a Time in Brooklyn? No, uh, it's um, Once Upon a Time uh, where I, his I son was dating a black girl. And yeah, yeah. So I I meet her parents. Right. I meet her parents. And I remember like we were coming out of it and I'm like, I was just nervous what they would, would think of me. And she said, were you nervous because you're worried about they think of you because you're white? I'm like, well, no, 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 no. I said, no, you mentioned, I guess that thought would cross my mind, but because that was a new experience for me. And I said, no, I just wonder what they think of me. She said, no, 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 she said, don't worry about it. They have, they have no problem with that you're white or anything like that. They're just relieved you're not Asian. And I remember. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> And I remember looking at her, she goes, oh, shit, don't even ask. She goes, I, I can't even with them. <laughs> and I'm like, I guess her last boyfriend before me was this it was an Asian. Wow. Guy. <laughs> I'm like, I guess we've all got it. We've all got the parents and, and grandparents but, and but uncles we've or whatever. all got we've those experiences got or we've all got those person, those people in the community that we thought were our community hero. And then we hear something about them that comes out and we're like, oh, that's messed up. And the, the uh, people there's a duality to all of us and film explores that. And that's yeah. where creativity and characterization and storytelling goes there. And I think that films shouldn't be af- so afraid to be canceled that we stop going there because then we stop telling human stories. And I don't want to get to that point. Good point. All right. What's next? McLovin says, hi, John. It makes perfect sense why Sam was not recognized in magic. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop you right there. <laughs> No, we've already established he was in that heels. No, it doesn't. My favorite line, I can't dance in these, I can't run in these heels. <laughs> that was a great line, by the I way. Love that line. I no no, like even in the new episode, even in the new episode, he Sam shows up in some refugee camp and like, hi, my name is and even everybody there's like, no, 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 we know who you are. I, I'm sorry. People in Tunisia recognize him in the streets. Kids in Philadelphia recognize him in the streets. Hell, he's in some European country in a refugee camp. So, oh, you know, we know who you are. Don't don't give me this. Oh, it makes perfect sense that nobody in this night. No, it doesn't. It made no sense. I get it. Everybody wants to defend the MCU, but I'm sorry. Call a spade a spade. That was lazy writing, <laughs> but it did give us the running in the in the high heel shoes. I was, but anyway, McLovin did write in, so let's finish reading what he okay. said. Okay. <laughs> Everyone, there is either a hardened criminal, assassin, arms dealer, or something crazy like that. Sam is the most useless Avenger in the grand scheme of things. His threat level to them is extremely low. He's not a heavy hitter or someone with a formidable power. So... Why would they recognize him? He's not even a blip on the radar. He's at the bottom of the totem pole. The event, the average citizen would recognize him because he would be somewhat famous. But the people of Madripoor have bigger things going on in their day-to-day lives, and they wouldn't bother remembering Sam, and the technically speaking Sam never saved the world. He got saved along with a couple billion others during the fight He took out maybe three guys in a battle that size. His contribution was negligible. If you were getting emergency heart surgery, you would never claim that the nurse who cleans up after the surgery contributed on the same level as the surgeon that actually saved your life. All right. Nonsense. Well, damn. (laughs) That's that's just absolute nonsense. It's just absolute nonsense. If anybody... Uh, all due respect, Mike Lovin, my, my film loving brother. I appreciate it very much. But no, nope, that's just nonsense. They made it very well established that people all around the world recognize who he is. And especially if you're walking into a club filled with hardened criminals and arms dealers and things like that, they are going to know who Avengers are. Well, you're going to know who's who in the FBI and the CIA yep. to look out for. And yeah. then you're going to definitely know the Avengers because they've got something beyond your little gun. Yeah, they can it's shoot like, lasers, but I just not thought it was Falcon, funny. But. After we had all these debates about should the people have recognized who he is, the very next episode, he just walks into a refugee camp. Oh, yeah, we know who you are. Well, of course they do because he's an Avenger and they just saved three billion people. You know, they could have so, put a hat on him and we wouldn't be we wouldn't have been having this discussion because it would be like, oh, well, it was a dark nightclub and he had on a hat and glasses. So, OK, maybe he was this. We wouldn't be having this conversation had it been two more articles office, of clothing. They, I mean, you didn't even do the Clark Kent thing, right? If you want to, if you want to go stupid like that. I'm like, a different human. It's like Kimberly's here. She takes the last off. Where'd Kimberly go? All right. <laughs> 
Anyway, but no thanks for that, Mike Love, and I appreciate it, dude. All right, what's next? All right, Con Campea says, finally canceled HBO Max. Gave it a couple more days, but they never fixed the ugly white scroll bar. Maybe I'll resub in a couple of months and see if it's fixed. Until then, I have 35 other streaming apps to watch. Yeah, so this came up um, the other day that... And and uh, Con Campia was not the only one to have this issue. There has been a number of people reporting an issue that uh, on certain devices, when they open HBO Max and they're trying to watch something on it, there's like a computer scroll bar on the site, some white computer scroll bar. And they have not, to the best of my knowledge, they have not yet identified this problem. Now, all hmm. I can say is, I have not had this problem, so I can't, you know, speak I to that it. Issue. I watched. Yeah, uh, most people don't, but a number of people do. And Khan was one of the people who well, did because I went and looked it up after you told me about it. It's like, yeah, this is a real issue. Actually, I remember hearing about it on one of the tech shows that I watch. This is a real issue, and I guess they haven't been able to fix it yet. If it was me, I wouldn't mind. I, I don't care. I would, I, the, the line bar would disappear for me. But if you're the kind of viewer that you saw it and really was always jumping out at you, I can understand. Hopefully, they'll get it fixed for you soon enough. You can get back to watching all the good stuff on HBO. All right, what's next? Julius A. Goodwin says, Long time no see, and good morning to you and my patron saint, Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. <laughs> Not going to do any kind of spoilers, but Falcon vs. Winter Soldier number four should kill kill any doubt that John Walker was unworthy to carry the shield and the title. I think it goes beyond that, Julius. Again, when you look back, when we look back at uh, Captain America First Avenger mm -hmm. and Dr. Erskine, we, this is not a small detail. You know, Tommy Lee Jones's character had one soldier in mind that he wanted, but he was just a big brute and a bit of a jerk. But there were dozens of army guys there whole camp full trying to to earn that spot and you know numbers of them must have been good men good men but erskine knew that wasn't enough to 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 suddenly be given the power that i'm about to give you and what the serum will do he needed to find an exceptional good man i saw julius i would say that i don't think it's not that we just learned beyond shadow that john walker is unworthy to carry the shield i think the message of that episode was hey nobody nobody um is worthy of carrying that shield or at least an extreme few even somebody like a carly who from everything we can tell from the show was a good woman who saw bad things happening to people and wanted to make a difference and help people even her with the super soldier serum, she's gone darker and darker and darker to the point that she's doing things that pre-serum Carly never would have dreamed of doing. So yeah, I think it's it's shown that that uh, Walker is unworthy to carry the shield, but I also think the message is almost everybody is unworthy to carry the shield. And that's going to be something that I think Sam and Bucky are going to have to struggle with too as they move forward. But anyway, there's that. Okay, what's next? Jesse is coming at us with one of two. I kind of hope Sharon isn't the power broker because I don't think it lines up story-wise. Zemo says he knows the power broker by reputation, but has never crossed paths during this time, his time in Madripoor. If Sharon didn't end up in Madripoor until after Civil War, by that time, Zemo was in prison. So how could he know about the power broker if Sharon got there after he was already locked away? I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something. See, this is where the other theory that some Somebody wrote in last week suggested which is what if the power broker is the dread pirate roberts from princess bride right where the D dread pirate roberts was a title that was passed from person to person so you know wesley got captured by the dread pirate roberts you know what was the line of uh, good night wesley good day good work most likely kill you in the morning all right until finally one day he said i'm not the real dread pirate roberts now there was the person who gave it to me and so i'm giving you you are now the. so what if that's the same thing look the bottom line is this i don't know who you think it is i think there are many problems with the sharon is the power broker theory i just think it's the least bad of all the bad theories Mm -hmm. Like the General Thunderbolt Ross, terrible theory. Um, the Sharon theory, not a great theory. Um, a lot of them, they're all bad theories. I just haven't heard a better theory yet. So I, again, I think there are many problems. And we're running theory. out of time. And like we're, we're on episode time. five of six. So I, I, I'm really excited to see who it is. And I'm wondering. Have you heard a theory that you like? I haven't. See, I haven't, I really haven't. either. Because it's not like WandaVision where it, it could be this. Like there's, like with WandaVision, it was like there are 
several good reasons it could be this person. There are several good reasons it could be this person and several good reasons it could be this person. Yeah. With this, it's like, I don't know. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. Ultimately, what I think is probably going to happen, it's just going to be a new actor, a new character. I was going to say, don't, and- don't pull an engineer on us and have <laughs> some guy walk from around the wall that we've never seen, don't recognize his name. We never even Hi, met the engineer. my name is Steven and I am the power broker. Who are you? And okay, here we go again. No, I don't, I don't want one of those moments. I hope it's somebody notable, but... But here's what I don't we'll want see. them to do. I don't want it to be somebody notable just for the sake of being notable. Because like, for instance, uh, for example, the Thunderbolt Ross theory that's out there makes no sense. It would be so random and so out of nowhere. Really, you think Thunderbolt Ross could be a full-time military general doing his duties and then Secretary of State uh, with all of his duties and he's also spending most of his time in Madripoor being the... The hey power. man, play has got to play. And, and not much, <laughs> they've never suggested that he is anything other than a very misled and big dickish good guy. I mean, that's he is a good guy at the end of the day, even if he is a giant dick. So it would just be so random. There's been no connection to Thunderbolt Ross. It would be so random and out of nowhere just to drop him in there for no reason. Do you think it'll be an end credit reveal? Because they're waiting so late. I wonder if it's if it's going to be. And it's such an integral part of this story. A good question. But you can finish this story without introducing the, the power broker. With Carly, we've got enough between John Walker and Carly to kind of finish this story and lead to, okay, we got them. Now we need to go after the power broker. Um, I hadn't considered that, because but there are, you're right. It could lead us into uh, whatever something other else. series is coming or into season, you know, give us something to chew on for season two. But, but here's the thing about Sharon. I don't know. Sharon, and this is why I think even though it's a bad theory, it's the most believable theory I've heard so far. Sharon, on the run from the U.S., she can't, blah, blah, blah. She's only been there for a while. But she's got access to top secret satellites that can track people anywhere on the planet that they are. Really? She's got this entire underground network of art, you know, art thing run. She, that People that nobody else could find. Sharon just had to throw a party, ask a couple of questions. I know where this doctor is hiding within his top secret buried in shipping canisters lab is. If at the very least... And I, I have not considered, but I think you might be right. This might be a post-credit thing. At the very least, Sharon walks into an office and says, okay, problem's dealt with. And then the chair turns around and it's Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget. <laughs> well done, Sharon. Or something, but maybe she's working. Maybe at the very least she's working for- I wouldn't be shocked if she, I, 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 you know. But I like your theory about it being a post-credit scene thing, maybe. So. All right, what's next? Connor M says, what if the next episode we found out Battlestar isn't dead? John didn't really check for a pulse and just tried to wake him. I feel like that would hit him hard. Joy for Battlestar being alive, but anguish over killing someone in cold blood for no reason. Okay, number one, not going to happen. But number two, oh my God, that would be a that would be a powerful moment. If someone was like, we needed to tip him over the edge, and we got to use the best friend to get to him, or like just him realize. Like, first of all, I think if John Walker found out right now that he killed the guy for no reason, he wouldn't care. But what a moment! If you can look back again to that moment of him of that real moment of self realization, they weren't even super soldiers. If he if they gave Wyatt Russell. A moment like that where he could really act it out and it's like he now hates himself like if he if suddenly Battlestar is alive and he's like and then he looks at the body the guy he killed probable and he's Mm -hmm. like and he now he's shattered his own image of himself oh my god that would be powerful but the real thing is if they even if they did say Battlestar was was alive I think John Walker would still be well one less flag smasher to deal with I mean, if that's wrong, but I, I think that's what he would be. But what a moment that would be if they played it that way. But no, nah, Battlestar's dead. Battlestar's dead. But it is the Marvel fake death universe. I like that. Um, I like that theory because I, I like could see like someone's hand in the pot saying, you know, OK, we've got John Walker where we want him. Let's push him over the edge. How can we do that? Let's get his best friend. You know, I, I don't, don't know. I don't know. It could be interesting. Dun, dun, dun. All right. What's next? The Wakandan Forever says, John, I love you with all my heart. But did I hear you say pizza eating cowabunga nonsense? Oh, yes. Bloody rage filled killers. Not my Ninja Turtles. Give me skateboards and vanilla ice any day. (laughs) What's your favorite childhood cartoon? Go Ninja Go Turtle Power. Okay. First of all, 
the the Ninja Turtles. I'm I'm sorry to shatter all your worlds. The Ninja Turtles you love are fake. That's a fake illusion. That's not what the Ninja Turtles are. They were transformed from their original version of truly epic, badass, wonderful, tongue-in-cheek commentary on the whole super zero genre characters into, you know what we need to do? We need to make these things for kitties on Saturday mornings. Let's make them ride skateboards and eat pizza and high five and say, cowabunga, dude. Those are the fakes. Those are the artificial ones. Hold a second. I'm digging into my my thing because I've got this thing because this came up, oh God, maybe six months ago. Hold a second. I got to find this. So that is not what the real Ninja Turtles are. The real Ninja Turtles are the brutal, the violent, um, the dead serious. Maybe and Christopher Nolan just needs to take over the Ninja Turtles franchise. I think franchise. he does. <laughs> okay. Here's, here's a frame from the original. This is the, or this is the real Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, all right? This is the real Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Let me read this panel from you, from you as you look at the, the black and white comics. This is the origin. This is how they actually started. This is the internal monologue. I hold my katana with a relaxed, ready position. To my left, Donatello and Michelangelo follow suit with staff and nunchuck. Raphael guards my right side. I sense his body quivering with tense energy, waiting to be triggered into savage, slashing release. I mean, they were just talking about killing people. Yeah. We're going to kill these guys. Then when they would be encountered by evil, whether it was the foot or whatever, that is what the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are. This bastardization mutation of them into Saturday morning kitty cartoons. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I'm as much into Go Ninja, Go Ninja, Go. And I am. I actually liked the... Not the most recent one, but, you know, the first new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie that was produced by uh, by Michael Bay, of all people. I actually got a kick out of that movie. The I one did. with Megan Fox? And um, I, yes, the she, one with Megan Fox. Yes. Uh, what's her name? Yeah. That was, I, I actually got a kick out of that movie. I did. The sequel wasn't so good, but I got a kick out of the first one. But these guys, these, these are the real, authentic, true Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Ready to jump into battle, being triggered into savage, slashing release. Release of this murderous compulsion. Let's go kill some ninjas. That's the, that's the team. I want somebody to make that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. That's the one I want. Forget this bastardization pizza <laughs> eating whatever. I want these guys. Let me see them. Anyway, sorry. Had to go off on that little uh, tangent there. All right, what's next? But what's your favorite childhood cartoon? Transformers. Transformers. Yep. Yeah. Easy Transformers. Nice. Let's see. Where are we? Sorry, I lost my. Did we lose play. our spot? I totally did. Oh, a second, I'm looking here. We're on Mike Schwenk, right? Uh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Mike Schwenk says. One of two. I understand the reason this year for HBO having same day releases. I still think HBO should be encouraging fans to go to the theaters for their big, big budget movies. With GVK, the first show was at 4 p.m., yet it was available on HBO Max earlier that day at midnight. Now I'm seeing MK next week. First showing is at Mortal Kombat. First showing is Friday midday. And again, I'm sure Max will have it available at midnight. Why do you think these movies don't have a Thursday night preview? IMO, they should have a benefit for seeing it in theaters. Um, you know what? It's, the thing is this. we got to keep this in mind. Things are not back to normal. I, and, I, and I'm going to assume and guess that uh, for we're not going to get normal for a while. Because, of course, the normal state of things is as a new movie comes out on Fridays, that really means that it comes out Thursday night, really. But the combination of... They're trying to time it with the release of when it comes out in HBO Max. They don't want to give it the day earlier because you don't want to favor hand right over hand left because, you know, they're both Warner Media companies, Warner Brothers and HBO Max. So I get it. And, and again, if we we're already back into the full flow of things, it would seem a little more, more odd. But because we're still so far away from it being everything being back into its normal operating procedure, it doesn't surprise me that it's being done this way 
for now. I don't expect for it to continue like into the at last part of the year and into 2022. So that's probably why it's happening like that for now. Good question, though, Mike. All right. What's next? Willow says, I would argue that the scene of Walker with the Flag Smasher is more mature than Thor killing Thanos because Thanos is fantastical being a purple giant, whereas we are seeing a human brutally beating another human to death. And that's more disturbing. Um, well, I mean, Willow, you, you make a point that I am telling people a lot. Listen, when it comes to movies and stuff, you can get away with a lot in PG-13 if you are doing indescribable violence to aliens, monsters, or animated things. Like, for instance, there isn't a movie you could have the good guys holding down the bad guy and another good guy comes walking up with an axe and cuts the bad guy's head off and you see his head bounce on the floor and roll away. <laughs> you can't do that in PG-13. Oh, but the bad guy is a giant alien titan. Okay, yeah, you can do that and still be PG-13. So, <clears throat> but it's close because with Walker, we never actually see him kill the guy. We see a camera on his arms doing this, but we, we don't see, you know, we don't see the shield cracking his ribs, piercing into his lungs and his heart. I mean, you and, see that bloody hand <clears throat> fall on the yeah. ground and that's, you know. Very symbolic. So it's close, but I will side with you, Willow. I would say that just the nature of the scene, the Walker one is probably a little bit more mature, but it would make, but it's not as easy as you might think to make that, that call because if they actually showed him being murdered, that would definitely make it obvious. But that blood was really, because you know shield. how we've always said that like, or a lot of people have said, you know, Marvel doesn't really show blood splatters like you see yeah. you know i think when captain america i i imagine i i remember when he was on his motorcycle and he was like shooting people all you saw was the guy go Ugh. you didn't see blood splatter you didn't even see bullet holes and they were really good about that because they were recognizing a lot of kids are watching but this when i saw the amount of blood on the shield yeah yep i was like Ooh. Yep, 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 yep. All right, what's next? Brooks Kirk says, Hey, John, I think I understand... I think I understand what you meant when you said that Walker in the Falcon and Winter Soldier was really good in episode four. I kind of agree with you. But after that, after what happened at the end, my official opinion is that John Walker must die. Opening scene with Bucky is incredible. Here's the thing. I'm not so convinced he does. I mean... Uh, okay, look, what did he do? Did he cross a line? Yes. But, and look, you know me, this is Walmart Captain America. I am no Walmart Captain America defender. But at the end of the day, what just happened? Did he just tie up civilians and throw them into a building and then blow up the building on them? No. He was at, at the end of a combat situation with known terrorists that have murdered innocent people just killed one of his friends and did he cross a line absolutely he did but is he at the point now that this guy has to die i i'm not there yet i have a feeling they're going to have him do things that's going to make him this guy has to die but he hasn't done them yet because look it, right now he's done something that he should probably be court-martialed for probably lose the shield and the captain america title for um and he crossed a line but again if we're going to be comparative, Carly tied up people, helpless people, tied them up, put them in a building and blew up the building with them in it and killed them. That's worse. That's where, and now we're getting into comparative ethics, but I mean, that is even worse. So I don't think he needs to die yet. I do think he needs to be held accountable. I do think there, something has to, there has to be repercussions for what he's done, but, but I have a feeling after this episode, he will do things that we're all going to be going, okay, now this guy needs to die. I, I think we're getting there. All right, what's next? This is coming from Caleb. Hey, John and Rob. Hope you guys are doing amazing. I have a theory for who the power broker may be. What do you think about the leader? He was in the Incredible Hulk movie, and he is still one of the villains lurking out there. What do you think? I will be honest with you. I like that one even less than the General Thunderbolt Ross one, to be honest, because whereas Thunderbolt Ross would be kind of random, leader would be like obtusely random like it would be so out of nowhere with no connective tissue whatsoever like it is true that another villain from that movie abomination he's coming back into the mcu into the she-hulk show 
but there's at least connection there. He was a villain in a Hulk movie. This is a Hulk family show. So having Abomination there makes sense. It's not completely out of left field random. Having Leader just magically show up there for no apparent reason whatsoever, I, again, I think would be a bad move. So I, I don't think that one will work. I, I, I would rather see Thunderbolt Ross being, and I don't think that makes any sense either. So that's kind of what I, my take on it. All right, what's next? Ethan Prestonkowin says... Borat 2 is up for Best Adapted, and Trial of the Chicago 7 is up for Best Original. Borat 2 is an original story because it's a sequel. It's adapted. And Trial, which is adapted from very real events, is original? Mm, none of this makes sense. Okay, I, I, I get that, Ethan. It does look a little weird, but it actually really does make total sense. Remember, the whole notion when it comes to the Academy of what is adapted and what is original, is it being brought out of an already existing work? That's the definition. Is it being created out of an already existing work? Therefore, when you look at Borat 2 or any sequel, it is born out of another already existing work, which is the original Borat movie. So yes, absolutely. Borat 2, or any sequel, Empire Strikes Back, Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, uh, whatever, any sequel is technically an adapted work because it is being born out of a previous work. So yes, Trial of the Chicago 7 is absolutely an original screenplay. Unless somebody wrote a book about the Trial of the Chicago 7, and then they based the movie on that book rather than the, directly off the real events, if they base their movie off the book that was written about it, that would be an adaptive screenplay. Otherwise, it is an original screenplay. Real life events is not a pre-existing work. So yeah, it actually makes complete sense and it is completely by definition. A sequel is an adaptation because it's being born out of a previous work and something like Trial of the Chicago 7 based on real events it's not based on a previous work. Therefore, it is original. So yes, it, that is the way it should be. That is the way it works according to the rules. And personally, I, even though I get it, on its surface, it can make you pop some question marks off, but it actually does make sense and it does work kind of the way it's supposed to work. All right, what's next? All right, some dude says, hey, John, oh, oh, what's your last name? Hold on, it's John something. <laughs> I'm freezing on it, one sec. Uh, hey, Google, what's that guy on YouTube, John's last name? Campia, John Campia. Why did I freeze on that guy's last name? Love the show and keep on the filthy. All right, fuck you, some dude. All right, no, no, let, no I'll, I'll honesty. So I, people give me such a hard time about this a lot, and it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> Here's, a lot of times people go, the guy from that movie, Rick... Uh, the guy Rick, with the, the, the glasses, you know. Like, so, but here's the thing. Here's what nobody <laughs> nobody understands. I do my shows live, two hours live, in which we will talk, cover a hundred different questions and topics, bringing up three to four hundred different names or whatever. And there's only so many in a live environment. Yeah, I know. All these other YouTubers who pre-record where they get to just stop and edit it and make it look like they were able to pull whatever. I do my shows live. I don't go through all the questions first. I don't pre-research. So when something comes up about a movie I've never seen, I just got to say, you know what? I've never actually seen that. If I don't know the answer to something, I have to say, you know what? I actually don't know what that is. A lot of these other guys out there, they pre-record and that's easy. I go hours taking questions from audiences so it's even on topics i can't pre-advance fix up so yeah once in a while and sometimes you know stuff and it escapes and oh in yeah, your you, head you i've had moments where i'm like harrison harris harrison oh what's his name obviously i know it's harrison ford but sometimes you just have a brain fart yeah, you know, I freeze on Elizabeth Taylor all the time. I don't know why I freeze on Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> I have in a trivia match, once, in a movie trivia match, I froze on Elizabeth Taylor. Are you serious? But it happens. It happens when you do like a two hour live show a day and you're literally covering hundreds of subjects, like, and because one topic can bring up 15 or 20 different subjects. And then we take 
20, 30, 40 live questions per day. And it, it happens. So, yes, I get the, the teasing I get for it. But I'd like to see anybody do better because it's not as easy as it looks. But well, it you know happens. what's fun, though? Because, I mean, obviously, I listen to the show is when I'm like, I'm driving or I'm listening to the show and I shout out loud, Chastain. <laughs> Jessica Chastain, John Chastain. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. All right, but it happens. It's a and group it will effort, and it will continue to happen. It will continue to happen. <laughs> All right, what's next? Alan says, "Hi, John. We have gotten the Zemo cut of dance scene. I love it, and have you seen it?" Also, since we have gotten the Zemo cut, I demand the Campia cut. We all want it, John, and would love to see your breakdancing videos. Release the Campia dance cut. You breakdance? Professionally. Shut up. When I was a kid, yeah. I used to, I used to uh, breakdance with the Steel City Breakers, and we actually had... Now, let me rephrase. When you say professionally, it's when you do something that you and you actually get paid for doing it. We actually did what? paying gigs. Yeah. Break dancing. <laughs> we break dance at parks and at malls. And we even got to open a couple of concerts. They would bring out like local break dance and talent. They would hire the. You've got your own rolled up cardboard somewhere that you oh. bust out on the side. I've got to find this. My video. break dancing name was Pisces because I'm a Pi I was part of some. <laughs> I was part of. I, well, no, I this, wasn't the, well, this wasn't Steel City Break, but it was like the Zodiac crew. I had uh, we, me and some people. We had this thing called the Zodiac. As ridiculous as that sounds, and we each had our own Zodiac sign name as our thing. And I, I was, I was Pisces. Shut up, everybody! I'm right there with you, Alan. I want to see it. Never gonna Can't happen. Can't be a cut. Never All right, guys, it's and my new a, mission to find the video and I release had, it on I my had own the platform. Full body Adidas windbreaker outfit that I won. I actually won my main expensive adidas windbreaker outfit that i would wear a lot i actually won in a weekly breakdancing competition at the local roller rink called the hamilton roller gardens oh my god and i would win competitions this do you oh, have I a know, gold right? chain and do it's, you have a kango hat it's hard to believe i never had i never had one of the hats i never had one of those hats do you have a gold chain uh of course i had gold gotta chains. see it i gotta see, i'm gonna find this and, is my new mission and, you realize that right and what i would do is i uh, not all the way down, but I shaved very short the sides of my hair. <laughs> then I, then I use sun in. Do you guys remember sun in the spray? Sun I use sun in to bleach to bleach the sides of my hair blonde. And then I had use had a razor cut little lightning bolts into the side of my hair. It is my forget hot air balloon ride. My new bucket list item is to find you break dancing with the lightning bolts. Nope. That's never gonna happen. There Come are on, a John. couple. There are Come a couple, on, John. <laughs> there are a couple of VHS tapes that I believe exist in boxes buried in the sub levels of the ranch back at the Campy Ranch up in Canada, but they will never be seen the light. There's of day. a member of the and Zodiac you, team out there. You know what the funny thing is, though? Here's the funny thing. You know who I am today? I'm Zemo in the dance club today. <laughs> when you see me in the dance club now, I am. <laughs> <laughs> that's totally me in the dance club now oh my god that's totally me in the if dance you club get now, drunk but... enough do you break dance i i you know it's never gonna happen goodness gracious never gonna happen all right anyway what's next victorville film archive says if the star trek movie has tarantino directing then it might be the best movie since wrath of khan which is also one that took place in san francisco well look here's the thing um the Wrath of Khan is, is not the one that took place in San Francisco, just so you know. The one that took place in San Francisco, uh, I believe, is the voyage home. That would be Star Trek IV. Uh, but at any rate, um, listen, I was as curious as anybody to see what a Quentin Tarantino-directed Star Trek movie would be. That said, there are a lot of Star Trek fans who did not want Quentin Tarantino anywhere near a Star Trek movie. Hmm. Because Quentin Tarantino, listen, as great as Quentin Tarantino is, Mm -hmm. And I love most of his, not all, but I love most of his movies. Mm -hmm. He only really knows how to make one kind of movie. When you see a Quentin Tarantino movie, you know, within the first five minutes, if it's a Quentin Tarantino movie, mm -hmm. like you'll know. Mm -hmm. And I, a lot of very diehard Star Trek fans, including I think Robert Meyer Burnett was like, he does not fit with Star Trek. It would not it would not be a good fit. You don't think it's one of those things like Guy Ritchie doing Aladdin 
I mean, if you ever said Guy Ritchie's doing the next, the, the new Aladdin, you go, world. what? And yep. I loved it. Yeah, I love what you he think did it could be Aladdin. a surprise like wow ugh. maybe but i mean his style is so ingrained that uh, uh, like i said then look i myself would be curious as hell to see what it would be but i also i think jumping up and down saying if quentin tarantino did a star trek movie it would be the best star trek movie i don't know about that i think it would be very different um but it, it would have to be quentin tarantino doing something i've never seen him do before which is step outside of his comfort zone and make something make something that's not a Quentin Tarantino style movie. I've never seen him do it. I've never seen him try. So I, I don't know. It'd be very interesting. Though. Mm. It would be very interesting. But it looks like that's not happening now. So it looks like that kind of got shelved away. But who knows? All right. What's next? Aren't Olav says, whatever happened to the He-Man movie? Eternia on the big screen could be epic, don't you think? I mean, it could be, but everything could be epic on the big screen. That's the thing. Everything could be epic. I mean, if you had told me, I know I come back to this a lot, but if you told me a number of years ago, they're going to make a movie about Legos. That's the stupidest idea ever. Inanimate, small, children's building blocks. And it's one of the most delightful animated movies I've seen in the last 10 years. I love that movie. But anything can be great. You know, my friend Christian Harloff, you know, he says it best. When he says, you know, when you think about it, a properly done He-Man movie could be a beautiful cross between Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. That's where a He-Man movie should live. Hmm. Now, they were talking for a while. They brought in a very interesting, like the director of um, Crazy Rich Asians. They brought in the director of Crazy Rich Asians, who's now directing In the Heights with uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda. Can't wait to and see I that. And I'm forgetting his name. Asian dude. And I'm forgetting the director's name. He also directed the Justin Bieber documentary. Never, uh, never say, say never. never. Yep. Don't never stop. Never stopping, which is <laughs> never the better stop version. Of never stop. You know, now it's killing me. I got to look up the director. I was what, just going to. Can you look him up there? I, uh, all yeah. that kind of stuff. So, I mean, it's like, uh, I don't know that. Uh, while I find his films very delightful, I don't think that's the guy to bring us Lord of the Rings crossed with Star Wars. Then they cast this guy. I think his name is Nick Centrino. And he is the star, the male star of the Netflix movie series uh, To All the Boys I Loved Before. John Chu. John Chu. Thank you. Did you watch any of those To All the Boys I Loved Before movies on you Netflix? You know what? I didn't. Okay. So Nixon Trino is the male lead. Now, of course, the main girl is this Asian girl in it. And my She's wife- adorable. She is adorable. My wife watched like in three days, watched all three of the movies anyway. So- but this, when they announced this Nick Centrino kid was going to play Prince Adam slash He-Man, this kid is a buck seventy-five soaking wet, maybe buck sixty-five soaking wet. And I remember, like, okay, I get it. In Hollywood, you can crank these guys with horse steroids and put them out on the farm to do nothing but bale hay and lift manure all day. I mean, hell, look at Kumail Nagiani and what that dude turned himself into. Oh man, but that was amazing. I can't wait to see it. That was an amazing transformation. transformation yeah. Him and Chris Pratt, him and Chris, the, the body transformations of those guys are crazy. But I just remember looking at the Centrino, the Centrino kid and going, this kid is maybe a buck 65. I mean, come on. I mean, I'm sure he can get bigger, but he man big now i've seen videos of him now getting ready to be in black adam because he's going to be one of the stars in black adam now. nice and he's in terrific shape nice he's in terrific shape but he's still lean but is he, he a bit lean he man hmm. he ain't he man he's in good action star shape right now which is way way beyond where he was before but he's still not he man. So I, I don't know what the status of that movie is is constantly changing and i don't even know if it's on their record anymore Hmm. I think they might have pulled its release date, but I, I'm not 100% sure right now. I'm as curious as you all look it up at some point. All right, what's next? Simon Blakemore says, hi, John and co. How y'all all doing? How you all doing? <laughs> I'm very Southern. I'm looking forward to the Mortal Kombat film, but I'm a bit concerned about the actor who they got to play Scorpion. Hiroyuki Sanada. 
who is don't, awesome. Don't get me wrong. I think he's a great choice to play Scorpion. And I think he will do a job. I'm just concerned about his age. He's 60. Because if I'm Warner Brothers, I'm looking at Mortal Kombat as a franchise. I'm thinking, how many films are we going to get out of Hiroyuki Sonata? Because it's not like Scorpion is a side character, Mortal Kombat. It's also a physical, demanded role like Batman. Just wondering what you... What would I do? I, I don't see what. four, but... No, that was... It was he three accidentally four. Made, he accidentally oh, made he did it twice. One, okay. That should have been gotcha. Four, four. Gotcha, Simon. Um, here's the thing. Do not worry about Sonata. I don't care if you saw him in The Last Samurai, or if you watched him in like uh, Avengers, or if you watched him in Westworld, or if you watched. Is he him also in, in um, the Walking the new uh, Walking the um, the Walking Dead or, or Army of the Army Dead. of the Dead? He's in the new Army yeah. of the Dead. Um, this dude, I know he's sixty. There is nothing that this dude is doing that does not look like he can't bring it. This guy. And the way he conducts himself, this guy can do this into his 70s. Now, Grant, and by the way, for all we know, Scorpion dies in the first Mortal Kombat movie. We don't know. We, this isn't like a Superman franchise where you have to have Superman in the Superman franchise. This is a Mortal Kombat franchise. They could kill any of these characters in the first one. And then you focus on other characters. There have been so many characters in the game. I mean, they may kill Sub-Zero and, and Scorpion in the first one. I'm not saying they will, but if they don't, don't worry one bit about Sonata. Do not worry one bit. He is still the man. And I think you've got it. And look, when you go into these franchises, you don't think 10 years. Yeah, you hope for 10 years. You hope to get 20. Unless you're like, casting a Tony Stark. Well, yeah, you know, a, a then, Tony Stark. Then, you but know. then again, Tony... Tony really, he doesn't have anything physically demanding to do. All the action is done in CGI, right? So if you're looking at that, like it's very, very rare that you get a Tony situation or you get a Hugh Jackman as Wolverine who did it for 20 years or stuff like that. You, but if you can get a guy that can commit to three movies, which are probably you're looking at seven years, maybe three movies, he can do it. This guy's a specimen. And he is a special actor and he still carries that gravitas on screen when he's on screen and he's speaking in, in, I, I think he's Chinese or whatever. And he starts growling his words. He's probably, I'm like, fuck that. I'm no, <laughs> he can be, he can come up to me with a mean look on his face and just ask me for directions. And I'll hand him my wallet. I mean, it's whatever you want. This dude car carries a terrifying screen presence, but also when needed, very something very soft. I mean, he's a great performer. If he sh if he had shown any signs of slowing down, I would say, yeah, I'm a little bit concerned. But right now, I have zero doubt he could do seven more years. I don't even doubt he could do another 12. But we're probably not talking beyond that. And again, you take into consideration, we don't even know if Scorpion comes out of this movie. He may die in this movie, for all we know. So I wouldn't worry about it. I would Now, look, if we were starting a brand new... Fr like, if we were starting Shang-Chi today... Could Sonata be your leading Shang-Chi? No, probably not at 60. But Scorpion? Yeah, he can do that. He can do that. I think so at any rate. Anyway, good question, Simon. All right, what's next? Colin Prime says, Hey, John, have you or Rob seen the Optimus Prime figure that transforms by itself? It's a creation between Rosen Robotics and Hasbro. And it looks awesome. I just wish I could afford it. I have not heard of such a thing. So give me a second. Um, uh, transforming Optimus uh, Prime uh, uh, Robotics Hasbro. Let me see if I can find this thing. Self-transforming, voice-controlled Optimus Prime. I'm just a robot in disguise. Voyager has uh, no. That's that's um, oh, that's not the right thing. Let me see if I can find this again. Let me try this. This came out 22 hours ago. Let me bring it up on screen here. So here it is. Let me see if it'll do uh, anything. So there, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So here, we, look at this toy. Okay, it's moving by itself. All right, that's pretty cool. Oh, that's a little fist pump. That's pretty cool. And you control it with your phone? 19 inches tall. Okay, I don't really care about any of that. I want to see this thing transform. All right, here it goes. Is it going to transform? 
I don't want to see an animated render. Okay, there it is. Wow, he actually transformed. Oh, and it transforms the exact same way the original toy did. Okay. Nope, I'd never seen that. How much is this thing? I'm not seeing a How price dollar. How cool. Said so they're only making 5,000 of them worldwide. Um, $700. Nope. Nope. It's very cool. Nope. Nope. Dang, homie. Nope. <laughs> that thing's going to have to give me a massage for $700. <laughs> I mean, there's no $700. No, just no, no. But that is damn cool. If somebody wanted to give it to me as a gift, I'd take it. But uh, $700, no, just no, I'm not. <laughs> I'll transform it myself, thank you. I'll go buy a $40 version of it and I'll transform it myself. All right, what's next? All right, Cesar Rivera says, Hi, one of my most anticipated films of 2021 is Dune. Me too. But I'm a little worried for its box office success as it's up against Shang-Chi, No Time to Die, Venom 2, and Halloween Kills. I want to see Denis Villeneuve make part two. How do you think it will succeed? Okay, first of all, let's be very clear. It is not competing against Shang-Chi. Shang-Chi comes out a month before this thing does. Look, in the modern era of movie going, as long as you have... As long as you're not just separated by one week, as long as you're separated by two weeks, that's an eternity in modern movie going era. When a movie comes out in theaters, most people who are going to go see it will see it within the first two weeks. That, that's just the stats. So, you know, we got Shang-Chi coming out at the beginning of uh, September. We've got Dune coming out at the beginning of October. So it is separate. It's got good separation from Venom 2. It's got decent separation from Halloween Kills. The only one it doesn't have good separation from is No Time to Die. Because No Time to Die opens the week after Dune. But listen, especially in 2021, as movies start to rush back into theaters, that's going to happen. So it has its opening. You know what it's opening against in its opening weekend? Uh, an Adams Family 2 sequel. Who cares? Oh, you'll be all right. You'll be, yeah, it'll be I mean, fine. it's good. I like Adams Family, but it, it, it'll be fine. Apples so, to crackers. It's guys. Not, not the yeah, same exactly. Thing. It's not really competing against anything when it opens. Now, yes, it's got no time to dial deal with on its second weekend, but I, and that's not ideal. It's definitely not ideal. But, you know, the way you phrase your question, Caesar, it's, it's competing against this and this and this. It's not really. It's really competing against just no time to die and not even on its opening weekend. So it'll do OK. Listen, the question of how will Venom or how will Dune do at the box office is a big question. Dune is a very heady piece of sci-fi. And it's definitely not the most popular piece of sci-fi. I think it's going to be brilliant. It's being directed by maybe the hottest director in Hollywood right now in Denis Villeneuve. It's got a terrific cast. It's an awesome story. It's going to be a visual spectacle to behold. But will it, such a heady piece of sci-fi, attract a big, big audience? I don't know. But if it doesn't succeed, it won't be because of overcompetition, right? It's going to take a hit with No Time to Die coming in the second week. But I don't think that's the biggest problem it has. It's going to be having a really good marketing campaign that wins over the imaginations of the audience. The first trailer was good, but it wasn't going to win anybody over. The first trailer was good for getting people who are already fans of Dune excited about the movie, but it wasn't a good trailer for winning people who don't know anything about Dune over. The real marketing campaign when it starts is going to have to win those people over, and we'll have to see how it does. And that is going to be the thing that determines whether or not this Dune project is going to be a hit or not. So, Because we know the movie's going to be great, because it's Denis Villeneuve. It's going to be great. But can it win people over and get them out to theaters? That's going to be up to the marketing department. All right, what's next? Simon says... <laughs> get it um so since you grew up watching star trek original and the next generation what are your favorite and least favorite episodes my favorite episodes of the original and next gen were arena the best of both worlds least faves are the way to eden and one and two code of honor i'll tell you what simon i never have known and i never do know the names of episodes I don't know the names of episodes on shows. The only show episode I know is the finale episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation because it was called All Good Things, which is a perfect name for the ending of the series because, of course, the saying is all good things come to an end. So the name of this, the, those episodes were All Good Things. But I don't know the names. The only other name I know is still to this day my favorite episode of the original Star Trek, The Trouble with Tribbles. 
<laughs> is my that is my favorite and I know that's a lot of people's favorites but the trouble with Tribbles not only gives us great Klingon stuff and all that kind of, but it's got the great humor and the Tribbles are wonderful and I love the trouble with Tribbles so that's my favorite one there with the next generation it's hard not to say all good things because I think that is the greatest series finale in television history I think the and it's most great shows don't have great endings but that one did, but really, I'm going to say, and I don't know the name of the episodes, but it's the Locutus of Borg one, when Picard himself becomes uh, assimilated and becomes Locutus. Those were my, that was my favorite episodes of the original series, of uh, uh, Next Generation, I should say. So I'll go with that. But again, I don't know the name of the episode. All right, what's next? Anonymous says, can't believe it's been 10 years since Fast Five and 20 years on the Fast and the Furious. <sighs> wow. You know... I, I believe the 20 years I live things. my life I a quarter still, mile at a time. I live a quarter mile at a time. <laughs> I still to this day hate the original Fast and Furious. You do? I, do. I love it. I hate it. <laughs> I love it. And I have become a big fan of the franchise. Yeah. But the first three, I hated. And I the reason I hated the first one was because, like, one of my favorite movies was um, Keanu Reeves, Patrick Swayze, uh, point Break. Point Break. Johnny Utah. Uh, Bodie. I'm with the FBI! <laughs> um, but here's the thing. I have done sit-down side-by-side comparisons. I remember coming out of Fast and the Furious and going, that movie is a plot point by plot point by plot point direct ripoff of Point Break. It is point break with a different skin put on it. You have your Bodhi character. You have your Johnny Utah character. You have, they're actually, you know, once he's getting really into the And they have the, the same world, vibe, yeah. They're, they're actually criminals. There's even a scene where he's chasing him down, where Paul Walker is chasing down the Vin Diesel thing, realizes them, lets him get away. Same thing as when Johnny Utah lets Bodhi get him. It is literally, and you sit down, and you do a side-by-side -side viewing of him. Plot point by plot point by plot point, it is a direct ripoff of Point Break. Then I just thought parts two and parts three were just terrible. I didn't like the second one at all. I didn't like Tokyo Drift. Rob likes Tokyo Drift. But when like they Tokyo started, Drift. when they added a uh, Ludacris, um, I was like, I, I really, I really started liking him again. And then I, I love how self-aware they are. It's become it's that so See, ridiculous. Because number but four, I love it. you you mentioned a great phrase there, self-aware. It was in four, and I remember going to the press street screening for four, thinking, oh, here we go, another bag of crap out of the Fast and the Furious. <laughs> And I remember coming out of four going, that wasn't bad. And I, that's where you started to sense the self-awareness of the franchise, right? And then, of course, then came five. And I think five, well, the end of four post-credit, I think that's where they introduced Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I think that was a post-credit scene. I can't remember. Oh, yeah. But then you get to five where Franchise Viagra got injected into the franchise. You had The <laughs> Rock come in. I love five and I love six and I love seven. I didn't love eight, but I still had fun with eight. I really enjoyed the franchise since, but yeah, I, I, it was rough for me the first, first few years, but 20 years. I love that very years. first one. I get, I feel you. I feel you. It is, it is point break 2.0, but come on. The introduction of Vin Diesel, <sighs> the, that bald head, that then, voice. How ridiculous is it? How ridiculous is it? When you go back to that first movie, right? Vin Diesel, he's he's a grease monkey, right? He's he's just fixing cars, wrenches. Somehow, by Fast and Furious five, six, and seven, he's it, actually the world's deadliest assassin. International. Um, it's like it's like Xander Cage and Dom yeah. were like, we're the same. He's the most no, dangerous man in the world. The dude and the access cars. that he has, the access he has to like stuff that the the freaking CIA is like, how did he get to that person? Um, he fixed his car as duh. But Come whatever. On. I still love him. I still, I, and I love Vin Diesel. I love yeah, Vin I Diesel do. so much. So you anyway, there's it. that. All right, All right. What's next? Javier Olivia says, do you think moving Snake Eyes to July is to try to release it before Shang-Chi? There is supposed to be an Asian fighting arts based in both products. Also, why did, why did you said some, 
time ago. Now could be a good time for a G.I. Joe movie. I'm curious. Well, no, listen, they they explained it very well. They made a lot of sense making this. There are two prime factors to moving G.I. Joe up. And I think it was Variety that laid it out the best. I mean, number one, we they just saw what happened with Godzilla versus Kong. Right. People are ready. It, I mean, not everybody. We're getting there. There's still a long way to go. But people are generally ready to go back to the movie theaters again. Godzilla vs. Kong proves that. Godzilla vs. Kong is almost making as much money as Godzilla King of the Monsters. And Godzilla King of the Monsters did not have a pandemic, did not have limited theater capacity, did not have some people still scared to go back to the movie theaters. And yet Godzilla vs. Kong is going to come close to it. It's going to come really close. People are ready to go back to the theaters. That's one. But what Variety wrote made the most sense. It's like, look, a G.I. Joe audience specifically skews younger. That's the demographic is younger. And if you're going to be going after the younger demographic, summertime when they're off school is ideal. So what did they do? They went to the last month. You know, they went into July, say this is where we're going to put it in July. And I think it's a good move for them. I think it's the right move for a movie like G.I. Joe. Not every movie should come into that summer slot right now, but it was a good move for a movie like G.I. Joe. So I don't think it has anything to do with, oh, wait a minute, there's an Asian in that movie. We can't have two, we have two Asians, in, Asians the month. <laughs> in the coming out within the same month. No, I don't think that had, I honestly don't think that had anything to do with it. Anyway. All right. What's next? Tyler Pfeiffer says, when Feige gets around to the F4, what are the chances we get a Doctor Doom solo show on Disney Plus? Hear me out. The live action iterations of the character have been absolutely piss poor, to put it politely. He's the type of villain that would benefit from a full origin story. You would be killing two birds with one stone. Introducing doom and mephisto in the same show his backstory is tragic i think very very small i think very small i i don't think we're introducing dr doom with the dr doom series um i think we're gonna get dr doom as a villain in fantastic four um when that movie comes around whether or not he'll be the main villain of the first movie don't know they might want to just introduce him have somebody else the main villain and then build up to him being the main villain of the next Fantastic Four or something like that. They also have the option of using him in the wider MCU, but I don't see them doing that. And I don't see them. And look, Loki's not really a true villain. He has done villainous things, but he's also been portrayed very much as an antihero many times as the god of mischief. Doom ain't that. And so I don't see them doing that for Doom. Is it possible? Yes. Could Kevin Feige break new ground doing it? Sure. Would I put money on it? No. Possible? Yes. Probable? No. So I'm going to guess on the uh, no side for that. Hmm. All right. What's next? Tyler Pfeiffer says, my second question is, do you see Doom being just a Fantastic Four villain or do you think he will be the next Thanos? God Emperor Doom would be amazing to see in a live action movie. In the comics, he rips out Thanos' spine. Yeah, but everybody in the comics at some point has been celestially the most. Actually, right now in the comics, like Venom right now is like this universal cosmic entity who can kill anything and anybody anywhere, anytime. I mean, and they've gone through this process with a lot of things. So yeah, hey, this one comic story that, yeah, that's true. I do think they are going to, look, I, which I just said, I think they could use him on a wider scale, but he is so identified with Fantastic Four. And Fantastic Four, we know, is a title that has a very special place in Kevin Feige's heart. That includes Dr. Doom. So I do think, I don't know, anything's possible. My guess would be that he's going to keep them attached to Fantastic Four. And then maybe, you know, later on, spin them off into something wider. Yeah, maybe. But I, I think he's definitely going to, the way Kevin Feige is so connected to the Fantastic Four property. He's given us a lot of hope and faith that whatever you do, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. And I think he's going to want to keep it kind of true to that origins but we'll see we'll see anything's possible all right what's next alan says hi john just saw mid-season trailer for the falcon and the winter soldier appears to show sam and bucky fighting walker for the shield if they do take if they do take it do you think the government would hunt them down would hunt them down for it and declare them both criminals no i don't think so uh, first of all, that little shot in the mid-season trailer, he goes, you don't want to do this. Yeah, we really do. That, I mean, I'm just like, come on. Come on. Thursday midnight. Wait. Get here faster. Um, 
I, look, it's Sam Shield. Cap gave it to him. Technically, it's Sam Shield, and he can come back with, oh, really? I gave it to the Smithsonian. Yeah, you well, told me this was false advertising. You told me it would be on display for educational and historical purposes. And the next thing I know, this fake Walmart version of Captain America. So if you want to play that game, we can play that game. Now, I, 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 <laughs> There's I, an argument. <laughs> technically, it is the government shield. Like, technically, it is the government shield. But Cap gave it to Sam. And the government never took it away from him. Which and, is shield its own private Entity or is it was Shield always a government? No, no, the Shield has nothing. No to do with Shield. Shield. Oh, Shield was a government branch. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So everything. So this technically, you know, the Shield does belong to the government, technically speaking. But I mean, the government allowed Sam the option of what to do with it. I mean, Cap gave it to him. It's up to him what he wanted to do with it. He decided he didn't want to use it, and decided intent instead to give it to the Smithsonian. The government then decided. We can think of a better use for it. So if Sam's giving it up, we're going to take it and we have a better use for it. We're going to give it to our new Walmart Captain America, our, our dollar store discount Captain America. And I'm bitter. But I so but understanding that context. Mm -hmm. I, I think Sam and Bucky will make an argument like, look. This dude across the line, he'd done this, this, and this. He almost caused an incident with Wakanda when he tried to fight the Dora Milaje. Mm -hmm. He just murdered somebody on foreign soil. He did this, this, and this. And yeah, I'm taking the shield back. And honestly, I don't think they're going to have a big problem with it. But I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to wait. We will have to we wait. We have three days. All said done. Just three days. Three long days. All right. What's next? Frankie Gouge says, just when you think Netflix is doing better, they come out with a film like Thunder Force. Mediocre, bad, not even bad enough to enjoy from that direction. You know, I haven't been able to talk myself into watching Thunder Force yet, but I know I have to. I mean, I love both actresses in it. I, I, I like them both. Um, the concept seems cute and funny, but you could tell from the trailers, this isn't screaming quality. It's not screaming quality, I so I have not brought myself to watch it yet. I, w I might even watch it tonight. I'll see if Anne wants to sit down and watch it tonight. I mean, we don't have a new episode of Invincible yet, and I don't think the newest episode of Mayans is out yet, so maybe I'll see if Anne wants to sit down and watch Thunder Force, but it doesn't look so good. Have you brought yourself to watching it yet? Yes. You did see it. Yeah. How? Well, I'm well, really disappointed. It's not good. And huh? it sucks because I love Melissa McCarthy. She's great. Octavia Spencer, I love her. I was an extra on Truth Be Told. And there was like, I, again, um, there, it's on Apple. There was this scene where I'm, I'm just like one of the people drinking water at the table. Like you can probably see my ear and my elbow. But like all day I was sitting across from Octavia Spencer hmm. and just small talk like, girl, it is so hot in here. I'm like, I know she is so wonderful. Like, I love meeting people in real circumstances and realizing they are so wonderful. Did I tell you she, she offered to make me brownies? Are you serious? I, you I, you take those brownies and I you met, eat them, John. I met her over the help. We were talking with the help. It was her and Jessica Chastain were, were paired up, and I was talking to the both of them. And I just fell in love with both of them. She both is them an authentic will person. Be in my heart. She is an authentic person. And I loved the concept of, like... Women at any age, at any shape, you know, to celebrate all of us. And we can all be superheroes. And superheroes don't have to be in a certain, you know, whatever. I love the concept. I was so excited when I saw the trailer. I was like, mm, but you know what? I think it'll surprise me. I was so disappointed in the final outcome. I mm. uh, That's disappointing to hear. I'll still have to kind of bring myself to watch it. But it's, it's very sad to hear that. Okay, what's next? T.R. Nunley says, I live in North Carolina, and the reason why Georgia became a film mecca is because the North Carolina legislation voted against LGBTQIA people, especially trans people like me, using the bathroom of choice, and many film projectors productions left north carolina in 2016 learn from north carolina's mistakes all right so this came up from a topic we talked about on the john campus show the other day and look i, I in the john campus show we're not here to talk about politics we're here to talk about movies in the movie industry when an issue comes up that looks like it's gonna have a direct impact on the movie in the movie industry we'll talk about the impact on the movie in the movie industry right now there's a big issue going on in georgia with voter rights suppression and, and stuff like that 
And I don't know, I don't even know fully what my opinion is on it. I don't, you guys don't care what my opinion on that is. But what is interesting is what is the impact on the movie business? Of course, Antoine Fuqua and Will Smith, uh, not just the director and star of uh, the upcoming film that they're doing, but they're also the executive producer and their production companies are on record of those things. They made the decision to pull that movie out of Georgia. Uh, the movie's called Emancipation. And they were going to shoot it in Georgia and they've decided to pull the movie out and other studios are talking about moving out and Tyler Perry, who's got this like world class production facilities up there. I doubt he's going to move. He's got too much money invested in there. But I mean, uh, from according to reports, he's even made inquiries about what it would take to move out. So uh, that's interesting. That's where this comes from. And it brings up a really the fascinating topic of tax incentives and movie shoots and production. Because you might want to think, well, why doesn't just everything shoot in Los Angeles and New York? Well, because there are states that create tax incentives that, you know, you will get X number of tax dollar credits for every dollar that you spend here in the state making these movies. That's why so much production goes up to Vancouver and Toronto. Um, number one, because they know they're in the most glorious country in the world when they go to Canada, but also because of the incredible incentives they get to go up there and shoot there. And that's the thing. But it's a fickle business. One week, the hot state to go and shoot can be Louisiana. There's a lot of shooting going in Louisiana right now. One week, the hot place to shoot is Carolina, North Carolina. But then it could be Georgia. But then it could be something else. And it doesn't take a lot for the entertainment industry to be a little fickle. So, you know, we're going to move our stuff over here. So uh, whether they do or don't, I'm not sure. But it'll be interesting to see if history repeats itself and how does the industry respond. Uh, so that's kind of my take on that. All right. What's next? Alan says, hi, John, it's happening. Everyone stay calm, John. I saw an article on IGN saying that a Gundam movie is coming to Netflix. This makes me very excited. What do you think? This seems like a cardinal sin to not have a theatrical release. We were talking about this on the John Campus show earlier today. You know, Mobile Suit Gundam, they said they're going to do a live action Mobile Suit Gundam movie. It's going to be brought to us by the director of Kong vs. Godzilla and or sorry, not Kong vs. Godzilla. That's Adam Wingard. It's being brought to us by the director of God uh, of uh, King Kong Skull Island. Uh, the director of that It's going to be live action and it's going to be on Netflix, which is really weird. And it makes me nervous for a couple of reasons. One, Netflix, they're awful with their original movies. They, they have one out of every 15 or 20 turn out to be really good, but most of their original films are terrible. So I'm a little bit nervous about that, but uh, I'll be curious to see what kind of budget they're going to give this thing. Um, this is a movie. I, you finally do, you know, either a Robotech or a Mobile Suit Gundam movie. I want to see that on the big screen. I don't want to see that at home. I want to see that on the big screen. So, I mean, I don't know, but who knows? Maybe it'll turn out to be the next old guard. You know, with Charlie Theron. That was great. Old I like that great. a lot. And I like the one with Chris Hemsworth. Uh, I didn't like Extraction. Extraction. I, I thought the action was fantastic. I thought the story was so bad. But uh, but uh, uh, The Irishman. Or maybe it'll be the next Irishman. It'll probably end up. Are they going to do a the series or just a two hour film? Did it's they say yet? Film. It's a film. Oh, it's just a film? So, oh, okay. uh, I don't know. Maybe it'll be great. Maybe it won't. But I am excited they're at least making it because they've been talking about it for a long, long time. All right. What's next? Ruben Wakefield says, hi, John and Rob. Hope all is well. I'm a sci-fi fan, huge on Star Wars, and most recently, Ridley Scott's The Martian. I loved all three of Tomino's 80s mobile suit Gundam shows. Do you like slash watch it? Will a live action Gundam movie series work and why? Well, I mean, if it'll work, it will be. I'm first, I, I did watch a lot of that when I was a kid. If it'll work, it'll work because they write a great script execute it beautifully and all that kind of stuff. It, it, I mean, so yeah, if they do all the things that every other movie needs to do, it can absolutely work. It can be a big, glorious spectacle film that could become a franchise for Netflix. I mean, who knows? It can also be utterly terrible depending on how it's executed. It's all about how it's executed. So it comes down to that. But a lot of us, I mean, it was surprising today. A lot of people on the show, when we were talking about this, writing the live chat saying, I've never even heard of Gundam. Mm. It's like, wow, because... I mean, it was bigger in the 80s and 90s. Like when I was a kid growing up, that's when it was pretty big. Um, but I think it could be the next big franchise or, you know, for Netflix. It could be a next big franchise of movies for Netflix. So 
Let's see. Fingers crossed. The hope is there, but they got to do the things that make other films work. Great script, good execution, great vision. If you can do all that, it can be something special. All right. What's next? 50 year old soldier says, I loved how they bookended episode four with Bucky's rise by being released from Hydra control with the descent of John Walker with the shield drenched in innocent blood. Your thoughts? Well, I mean, I even thought the great juxtaposition was the whole the opening with Bucky getting freed. Delivered. With Io. <laughs> that was like a church deliverance. <laughs> but with Io taking his arm off. Like the hope and emotion and joy with the disillusionment and feeling of betrayal. I loved his, act, his acting right there. Oh, so she good. was saying the words and he was he was so afraid. Like, I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to hurt any of these people. And she's like, you're free. And I was yeah. like, hallelujah. But you know, you know what else? Somebody brought this up on the show earlier. Great juxtaposition between that and then episode one, when she's saying you're free and he's crying and weeping, but a few years pass and now he's sitting in a therapist's office and a therapist says to him, you're free mm. and his reactions now is totally different to do what he has now struggled with purpose and it's so beautiful. And you're right. That whole thing about that, you're open that episode with such hope and joy. You end it with that I image that of a moment. drenched blood. Sh oh, I love that moment. Powerful moment. Powerful moment. This All show right. is really, it's getting there. It's, it's, it's really, finding its footing. I really, I'm really loving um, what they're doing. All right. Really what's next? It. This is coming from Ruben Wakefield. One of the main things that Falcon and Winter Soldier does well is improve the philosophical and social commentary that was started in Captain America, Winter Soldier, and Civil War. As of now, all the characters have made big compromises. The right thing is blurred. Listen, that is, you know, we keep saying that is one of the key things Spot that is on. making this show work is the multiple level and multiple dimension aspect of all the characters. Even somebody like Zemo. How many people are loving Zemo? I mean... He's my new are, TV boo. I am really loving him. Blew up the UN reason. and killed people at the UN. He totally did. People are loving him. <laughs> I'm ashamed. And people are loving him. <laughs> right? Sharon is getting into some nasty, dark stuff. Um... I mean, Bucky himself is struggling with a lot of things. John Walker, an American hero by every measure, by every measure, an American hero. And look what's happening to him. Ev Carly, you know, the evil leader of the, but she was a girl who just saw people hurting and wanting to do something to help. They are giving multiple dimensions and multiple layers to these characters because that's real life. And you can sum it up by saying they're exploring the gray. Yes. They're, this show is exploring the gray. And the quest by a lot of people, even the best meaning people, to do the right thing isn't as easy as an option that you might think it is. What's the right thing? I mean, I was watching, I came across a show, I don't watch it all the time, but a little guilty pleasure thing here, I, I admit. Once in a while. My Little Pony? No, no. I'm not a brony. I'm You're not a brony. A brony. <laughs> but I was... This one time I got sick and I was just watching a lot of stuff on Netflix, or whatever. I actually got picked up on. I started watching Grey's Anatomy and I don't watch. I don't really keep up with it. But once in a while, if I'm sitting down for lunch and I've watched. It's all my been on shows, for what, like almost 20 years, 85 years. years like I can't remember. So I popped on a recent episode because I was sitting down for lunch. I like watching The Rookie with Nathan Fillion, but there was no new episode. Uh, I like watching uh, Chicago PD, but there was no new episode. There was no new episode of Invincible. I got to watch that with Anne anyway. So none of my shows that I watch regularly had any new episodes. So I fired up Hulu and I put on, oh, look, the, the, so I popped on an episode of Grey's Anatomy while I'm eating lunch. And there's this one doctor who, and this is how it ties into what we're talking about. This doctor was like, okay, we were doing these free COVID tests for people in the community. This kid, this teenage kid just tested positive, but he won't go home. So the doctor asks one of the odd doctors, why won't that kid, that kid just test positive. He's got to go home and isolate. He says the kid doesn't want to go home because he lives in a two room house with like 12 family members and he doesn't want to get any of them sick. And he's got nowhere to go. So the doctor says, and I guess this doctor is kind of rich. He says, all right, he pulls out his credit card gives it to that doctor says go book him a hotel room that he can go and quarantine for a while right doing the right thing and so he liked the feeling of that 
So he did that for a few other people who tested positive that come in from crowded homes. Mm. A little bit later, another doctor comes up to him and says, you asshole. And he's like, what? He goes, do you realize that there is a charitable organization that tries to get that has deals with hotels to get cheaper hotel rooms to put up people in the wintertime, homeless people in there to get them out of the cold. But they're throwing those people out now because they have a full paying price uh, person and that person oh, is you. Oh, no. And so. Oh, man. I, the reason that stands out to me is because exactly what's going on in Falcon Winter Soldier, the, just the way Reuben Wakefield just puts it. What's the right thing? Because on the surface, what that doctor was doing was the right thing. Only he finds out he's ruining people's lives by doing it. And it's like, so it, Falcon and Winter Soldier is doing that. I love it when shows challenge us with our perceptions of how black and white the right thing is when realistically it is often in the gray. And I like the way they're doing that. They're not shying away from it. All right, what's next? Ruben Wakefield says, the new Cap killing publicly is huge, but Cap killing is not new. Even in the MCU, Walker was grieved by Lamar's death by terrorists, where Steve showed restraint, fighting a close friend like Tony, who did not kill Bucky. Zemo has the strongest convictions. Yeah, and we were saying this before is that, look, yes, Captain America... The Steve Rogers Captain America has killed people. We saw him in First Avenger walking into Hydra bases and with his gun firing and and killing people. Or at the beginning of Civil War, as he's fighting Romulo and his uh, and his uh, guys, uh, Crossbones and his guys, and they killed some people. But it was always in terms of the action and trying to prevent a great atrocity. We never saw Captain America have a defeated opponent in front of him and going, "All right, going to execute you now." cut off your head that never happened and that is the big difference between them but so you're right Ruben. it's gonna be interesting to see like we said earlier what are they gonna say in falcon over the shoulder is the reaction of the government are they gonna back him or are they gonna to try to revoke his captain americanness it's gonna be interesting to see where they go all right what's next Samira O oh says, I'm a big fan of comic book movies, so I was looking forward to the DCEU. But other than Wonder Woman 1, none of, the, none of the movies appealed to me. The actors were well cast in the DCEU. That's it. Snyder Cut was okay at best. Let me go to part two here. Do, do, do. So I don't want the Snyder verse to continue, but all I read in here is that the fans want to see it. I'm annoyed that these people think they can speak for me. Well, I mean, look, we were talking about this the other day, too. This is it's not just the DCU. Every fandom does this. Everyone. I don't care if you're Bond fandom, Star Wars fandom, Marvel fandom, Harry Potter fandom, doesn't matter. Um, yeah, there will always be within all those fandoms certain groups that want certain things from that fandom and they think they speak for the fans like i remember watching something uh, reading something about star wars and certain people wanted something to happen with star wars and then saying the fans want this and i'm like hold the f up you are not you don't speak for the me bro fans you speak for yourself and maybe a couple of your friends who are like-minded but you do not speak for the fans because i'm a fan and i don't want what you're asking for but, but they all do it. And I'm sure I'm guilty of it, too. I'm sure we've all done it. The fans want this. No, no, no. You want that. The reality is, it, there is a segment of the DC fandom and of comic book fandom that would like the Snyderverse to continue. But they are only a segment. And we are learning now that like the viewership numbers on Kong versus Godzilla and even Wonder Woman 84, like blew the uh, particular Kong, Godzilla versus Kong blew the Snyderverse viewer numbers out of the water that we covered a story last week. Variety reported on, on a study that showed that only about one in three people who started watching this, the, the uh, oh, yeah. you saw that one, right? Watch the whole thing. Actually yeah. watch the whole thing. Only one out of every three people <laughs> who started watching the justice league uh, on HBO actually finished it. Uh, at least within two weeks, at least who knows, maybe somebody started watching it and then three weeks later went back and finished it off. I mean, it was a four hour thing, so probably not a, not a ton of people watched it all in one sitting. And not everyone was as invested. Yeah, not everyone's that invested. So the reality is there is a strong segment of people who would like to see the Snyderverse continue. I'm not going to lie. I would like to see the Snyderverse continue. 
I again, I think Man of Steel is the one of the best comic book movies ever made. I think it's easily the best DCEU movie. I really enjoyed Batman versus Superman. Um, I like the theatrical version of Justice League, and I like the HBO version of it even more. But I get why they're not. I understand why they're not. There are some very easily to view, very black and white business reasons why it hasn't worked the way they wanted it to work and they need to change directions. I get it. Would I like to see it? Yes. But but let's not point at DC fans and start saying they're all that. No, 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 no. Every fandom does it. Star Wars fandom, MCU fandom, they all do it. There's always segments within individual fandoms that pretend like they speak for the fans when really they don't. They speak for them and like-minded people, but they don't understand that they don't represent everybody in that fandom. And, and, and every fandom has it. And we've all done it. Don't point fingers. Because here's the thing, Samira. I understand your frustration with it. But be self-aware enough to know that you've probably done that yourself. As I am self-aware enough that I understand I've probably done it myself. So let's not point fingers. Because I think it's just a common thing in fandom. All right. We got time for just a couple more. What's next? J Meister 25 says, imagine if Walker did not kill that man in public, even if he was begging for mercy, it would be the flag smashers word against the U.S. military. A U.S. soldier killing a terrorist away from the public would be all part of the plan, as Joker put it. Listen, I'm telling you, I still don't know that there's going to be any repercussions for him, even though he did it in public. Again, I don't know this, and I'm, I'm not, I don't feel convicted enough about this to put any money on it, but I kind of suspect the government's just going to go, Yay, Captain America brought a terrorist to justice. I think they're going to back him. I don't know, Jay Meister. Maybe yes, maybe no. We'll find out soon enough. All right, what's next? Ben Rayner says, hey, John, I know you're busy and have no time, but I was curious if you're still planning on doing that YouTube tutorial live stream. I watched your old one. Curious to hear your updated thoughts on it. Also hope everything is good with the house. Uh, thank you so much, Ben. And yes, this morning on the John Campy Show, we did announce that tomorrow, that'll be Wednesday, uh, April 14th, at 4 p.m. Los Angeles time, that's 7 p.m. New York time, we are going to be doing a live stream on how to YouTube. So I'm just going to take an hour or two just taking your live questions about anything you want to talk about. You want to talk about cameras. You want to talk about switchers. You want to talk the, the, the monitors I use. You want to talk about the lights. You want to talk about lenses. You want to talk about mics. You want to talk audio interfaces. You want to talk speed editors. You want to talk about speakers. You want to talk about software. You want to talk about the image editing software. You want to talk about my audio software. Do you want to talk about my live mixing software? Do you want to talk about principles and best pack practices? Do you want to talk about how to pick a topic for doing YouTube? Whatever it is you guys want to talk about, we will talk about in that dedicated video tomorrow. So yes, if you're one of the few people that is interested in that sort of thing, make sure you tune in tomorrow for that. Once again, that's tomorrow, Wednesday, April the 14th, 4 p.m. Los Angeles time. We'll look forward to seeing you there. All right, what's next? By the way, I'm so glad you're doing that. I will be tuning in. Oh, <laughs> you guys, I have to, I'll be great. reviving mine and I, I'll be tuning in. And, and YouTube... It's how I learned to do so many technical things. And Me so too. I, John, I will be a student with my notepad ready. <laughs> All right. Dark Steel says, with the ending of the last episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, do you think the world will be outraged at the U.S. and part of the United States trying to change their image is changing War Machine's name to Iron Patriot? I don't think I don't think we're going to see the War Machine to Iron Patriot thing. I don't think we're going to see that yet. Uh, that may come in the upcoming War Machine has his own Disney Plus show coming. Uh, so they might delve into it in there. But between Wanda taking over a town, between the world being told that Spider-Man killed a good man, Mysterio, now seeing Captain, Captain America killing a person in front of video cameras, this could be, again, I don't know that they're doing this. I'm saying it could be become a part of a larger narrative of the world second guessing the role of superheroes and what are they and who are they? So, I mean, it is, we could get into this. And, and it world could be a great setup for a Fantastic Four because by the time they come in, America's got a lot of drama going on and a lot of it's being caught on camera phones and um, people getting, you know, hypnotized. And yeah, I could, I think this is, I think this is all 
a really good setup for Fantastic Four. It won't be the cheery like Jessica Alba version where it's like, oh, Sue Storm, da, 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 and aren't we so great? I think people will be looking at them with a side eye because of what's being set up. All right, and, and then let's not forget too the events that brought on the Sokovia Accords and all these sorts of things. These are all things that are fresh in the minds of the public in the MCU, and that could become very relevant That's for what right. the MCU is moving into in their new phase. All right, last question today. What's next? The last question is coming from Greg Scott Bailey. Okay, John, don't hurt me. <laughs> Just teasing. I watched The Terminal for the first time, and I really enjoyed it. I would have ended it a tad more sappy. Won't spoil it for others. Haven't seen Amistad yet either, so I promise to follow with that one soon. It's funny. You just named my favorite and least favorite Steven Spielberg movie. Of course, Amistad with the with the um, with the great Jaimon Hansu. It's really the world that entered it's the movie that introduced Jaimon Hansu to the world. Of course, he later went on to be in Gladiator, one of the greatest movies ever made. Um, Amistad is my favorite Steven Spielberg movie. I love that movie so much. The Terminal is to me Steven Spielberg's one bad day at the office i would love to say that i that was tom it. hanks i believe it was tom hanks stanley tucci Catherine zeta jones um and it's bad i mean it's funny whenever i say that i get a lot of people writing into me and say but john i like the terminal that's awesome all movies subjective just because i didn't like it doesn't mean you shouldn't like it not at all if you love it awesome i wish i was there with you steven spielberg to me is the greatest filmmaker of all time but that was, to me, his bad day at the office. I find that movie cringy and like, uh, and not funny. And oh, no, everything else that man touches is gold. But I got to go watch it now. Oh, so you've never seen it yourself? <laughs> I've never seen the terminal. I'm telling you what, a lot of people write to me and say they really like the Greg just did here. Like a lot of people write to me and say they really love it. And that's awesome. But it's just the one Spielberg film to me that just never worked. I'm right but. behind you, Greg. I'm about to go check that out myself. <laughs> All right, guys, that will do it for this installment of the companion videos. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of this. I, of course, want to thank Kimberly Curran for being here. Kimberly, where can people follow you and your magnificence online? Yeah, you guys can find me on Instagram at wasgoodkimberly, K-I-M-B-E-R-L-Y. And, of course, you guys can follow me on uh, various social media channels, Twitter, Instagram, things like that. Simply at John Campy, which you can see down there. All right, guys, don't forget, do the four main things. Stay smart, stay safe, take care of yourselves. Please take care of the people around you. Again, tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., the John Campy Show, me and Robert Meyer Burnett. At 4 p.m. tomorrow, Los Angeles time, we will have How to YouTube. Uh, it's going to be open stuff, talking about everything you guys want to talk about regarding getting started in YouTube, how to advance in YouTube. What uh, You want to talk gear, you want to talk software, you want to talk practices and principles philosophies we can do all of that come and join us for that all right guys listen there are still more questions to come we got a good chunk into it though we're getting near the end there uh but we will pick up tomorrow if you haven't seen your question answered yet and you sent it in sometime today don't worry we'll pick up with those questions when we do the john campia show tomorrow so that'll do it for me for now guys thanks a lot for being here my name's john campia until next time my friends bye bye